Okay, um, once again, we're going to get started again. I apologize for that. We had some issues with the audio. So we're going to go ahead. Um, my co-host, Mike Ventry, should be joining us in just a second. I don't know what happened on that end there, but we're going to go ahead and proceed. Um, I see some questions about the audio. I think you should be able to hear me okay now. If you guys have any questions or you're still not hearing the audio, please let me know. Um, my name is Larissa Green with Advanta IRA. We are going to be talking very specifically today about rental real estate in an IRA. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to go over, our part of our agenda today is to go over the different types of accounts that can be self-directed as well as investments we see, but then we're going to be talking very specifically about rental real estate and how to manage it within the IRA. So um, I'm still getting some people that can't hear anything. Um, give me just a second. Um, so my name again, Larissa Green, Advanta IRA. I'm the Director of Education with Advanta IRA. Uh, we have been in business doing self-directed IRAs for just a little over 14 years now. We only hand, handle qualified funds, so basically IRAs, uh, 401ks, ESAs, and HSAs. We have two offices nationwide. Um, we're in Atlanta, Georgia, as well as Largo, Florida, but we can help anybody anywhere. Um, we also have an um, extensive learning center where you can either join us for events um, via webinar like today. You can also attend live seminars at our office, and we do travel at times um, in our local areas. You can also check us out on demand with the Advanta IRA Learning Center or go to YouTube, type in Advanta IRA, and check out webinar recordings. Um, we also have our Advanta blog where we're always talking about uh, subjects that interest those people who want to self-direct their IRAs, the rules, any updates or changes in contribution limits, and so on and so forth. So if you have questions on joining us for other webinars, you can let us know or check us out at advantaira.com forward slash events. When we start talking about um, the different rules involved for self-direction, it's going to sound like a lot of information. Uh, what I want everybody to keep in mind that's on the webinar today are just three very important points. And if you have questions beyond that, you can always reach out to us. But the very first one is any IRA or former employer plan qualifies. So if you have an account and it ends in IRA, it can be self-directed. Um, any former employer plan can be rolled into an IRA, and I always get the question, what about if you're currently employed? If you are currently employed, uh, the question basically is going to be something that you would have to ask of your plan administrator, so whether or not they will allow you to roll funds into an IRA and self-direct them is what you're going to have to uh, reach out to them to find out. Another key point is you choose the investment. So Advanta IRA has absolutely nothing to sell you. It is up to you how you want to um, invest your IRA funds, whether it be directly into something like tangible real estate or something else. And I'll talk about the different investments we see in just a moment. And then all expenses are paid by the IRA and any income is received by the IRA. And that's very important when you're talking about the rules and how self-directed IRAs are handled. So why haven't people heard about self-directed IRAs? Well, the number one reason is just because there is not a whole lot of uh, self-directed IRA administrators out there like Advanta. Charles Schwab, um, Fidelity, Morgan Stanley, they're all great companies, but they've made the business decision basically not to allow people to invest in alternative assets or something that they consider hard to value. They're also just simply not set up to receive rental income or mortgage payments to an IRA, or maybe in some cases even pay a mortgage on behalf of an IRA, and so they've made the business decision not to hold those assets, where here at Advanta, we've basically done the opposite. So. Um, we will hold things that are not publicly traded, and we've made the decision not to hold things like um, publicly traded stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. 
it's actually less than 2% of all accounts, including retirement accounts, pension plans, and so on, that are invested in truly self-directed or private investments. So I mentioned earlier the different types of a pl different types of plans that we can hold, but um, basically, if again, if it ends in IRA, we can hold it, as well as some others like individual or solo 401k plans. We also will help you with health savings plans and education savings plans. And basically, the idea there is that the rules for self-directing those accounts are the same, so we can help you with those. Up here on our list, I have traditional and Roth IRAs, and I do think that those are the most common. Many people have heard of those types of accounts or maybe even have one themselves. SEP IRAs, simple IRAs, and solo 401ks are plans for small businesses or sole proprietors or independent business owners. So if you're a sole proprietor or you own a small business and you want to have a retirement plan, those are plans that you want to look into um, where you could possibly get deductions for yourself and your company and also save for retirement. So they allow for a much larger contribution limit on an annual basis. Um, some of them allow for employees in the company with a solo or individual K okay, as the name implies, you can't have any employees, but if you have a partner in the business or a spouse, you can include that person in that uh, plan as well. If you're just joining us for the webinar, uh, we did have some audio issues in the beginning. I think we're up and running good now. If you have questions, I will take questions on the webinar. Um, just go ahead and type your questions into the chat box, and I'll address them as I receive them. Um, I hope that the audio is okay now. I did get a few comments that the, the audio is better now. We were supposed to have Mike Ventry on as a co-host, but he was unable to get on. I'm not sure what happened there. But um, anyway, so again, ch type your questions into the chat box, and I'll get those answered for you. So here are the plan contribution limits, and again, I'm not going to go into the plans too much. I just wanted you guys to have an idea of the differences between the plans and the contribution limits allowed on an annual basis. You can see here with a traditional or a Roth IRA that it's 5500 annually, but with a SEP, simple, or solo 401k, they allow for larger contribution limits. And again, those plans are for sole proprietors or independent business owners. Um, ESAs and HSAs are listed there as well, and if you have questions on those plans, please don't hesitate to contact me, reach out to me after the webinar, and we can talk about those. So types of assets, and there's really no definitive list provided to us by the IRS that says here's what you can invest in. As a matter of fact, what they do instead is give us a list of investments that you can't make, and it's a very short list, and I'll go over that in just a minute. But what I like to do is give everybody an idea of the things that you that we're seeing that you can invest in to really get you thinking about maybe what it is that you want to invest in. And I did have a question pop up here on unrelated business income tax. Um, I'm not going to really talk about it during this webinar, but just to quickly answer it, and then if you have more questions, please feel free to reach out to me. But basically, unrelated business income tax is um, something that the IRA incurs when business income is being um, returned to the IRA. So in most cases, you're going to see passive income, things like rental income or interest on a mortgage being paid to the IRA. Those things are passive and don't generally um, – the IRA doesn't generally incur business income tax when it's invested in passive income. If you have something where an actual business is being run through the IRA, then that is something that you could incur that, that tax with. Um, so types of assets, again, this is just an example list. Um, it's not you know, something that you have to abide by when you're choosing an investment, but real estate assets um, are going to be the most common investment we see. They make up for about 33% of the investments. Um, we don't see too much commercial real estate, but it is certainly something that is allowed. Uh, rehabs and flips, you can definitely purchase a property, rehab it, turn around, and sell it. And I like this as an example because it really just illustrates that there is no certain amount of time that you have to hold a property within an IRA. Because an IRA doesn't pay capital gains tax, you don't have to hold a property for a year and a day, for example, to avoid anything that would be considered short-term capital gains versus long-term capital gains. All of the gains are just returned to the IRA simply tax-deferred or tax-free depending on the type of account that you have. Um, so that being said, if I buy a property tomorrow and I find somebody who wants to purchase it from me the next day, then I can go ahead and sell it. And once the income or um, earnings are returned to the IRA, then I can go ahead, turn around, and buy a new property. And that's all going to be completely up to me as a self-directed IRA account holder. 
Um, I had another question pop up here. Um, I understand that you can purchase real estate with both um, an IRA and personal funds. When rental income comes in, how can it be split proportionally? Uh, that's a great question, and I'm actually going to address that towards the end of the webinar through case studies. Uh, we have three case studies we're going to be talking about, and it is, you know, um, how to hold the rental property either directly through the IRA, using a property manager, or in something um, like an entity like a checkbook um, LLC. So I will be talking about that. Um, so again, back to our examples, we don't see timeshares too often, and when we talk about the rules and who can benefit from an IRA-owned asset, you'll see why um, the timeshare would have to be owned by the IRA and not used by the IRA account holder. Um, but it is something that certainly you can do as long as you're abiding by the rules. A residential property in any form, so that could be, um, you know, if you like to invest in three twos or two ones, condos, duplexes, any of those things will work in the IRA, again, as long as they are for investment purposes. Um, the paper side of investments, mortgage loans, uh, you can lend money, have it secured by a property. You get to be the bank, as we like to say here at Advanta, and make the determination as to um, whether or not it's going to be interest only or amortized. If you are going to have um, you know, a two-year term or if it's going to be 15 or 30, you can also determine the interest rate and what the late fees are going to be, and in some cases even who's going to pay advances fees, because if you're lending money to the borrower, that may be something that you want to pass along to them. We do see tax liens, and I know um, here in Florida it's kind of tax lien season, so I don't know where you're located, but if that's something you're um, interested in investing in, they do have a certain time of year that you put bids on tax liens, and if you're awarded, then it can be purchased through the IRA, and we can help you do that. So if you have questions on that, let us know. It can be an unsecured note. So Advanta does not give any uh, tax, legal, or um, investment advice. So if you have questions on that, you could seek um, help from a professional a CPA. Maybe an attorney can help you vet the investment and determine whether or not it's something that you want to invest in. But you can certainly do unsecured notes. And so if it's something that you're comfortable with, that is something we can help you with. And I actually do see a large number of unsecured notes, usually to businesses and not necessarily to an individual. But if that is an investment that you bring us and it's within the rules, then you can do it. I guess with unsecured notes, a lot of people um, find that they're getting a higher interest rate on those. And so maybe that's what the benefit to those types of investments are. The venture notes, very similar to unsecured. Option contracts and assignments. And again, these are something very similar but something that you can do through the IRA. Um, an option contract might be something a little longer term, an assignment something shorter term, but basically putting a deposit down on a property and then finding somebody who wants to either buy the contract from you or um, someone you can assign the contract to. Joint venturing, we do see a lot of that. So if you're not familiar with that term, um, basically lending money on a project and not only receiving the interest back on the loan, but also a portion of the upside once the property is sold, and then accounts receivable. And again, these are just examples to give you ideas of what we're seeing people invest in and maybe to give you an idea of what you might want to invest in as well. I saw another question pop up here. Is there uh, any large tax disadvantages um, that you – may not use depreciation on, say, rental property held by an IRA. And that, that is correct. You do not get um, to claim any uh, depreciation. You don't get deductions from an IRA-held asset. Um, because it, remember, it isn't paying taxes, and so those are going to be uh, something that the IRA cannot take advantage of. And there's actually only one case, and we're not going to go into that today, but if you're um, purchasing a property and you're using a loan to do so, the IRA can have a loan, and then that would be the, the only case where you might get to take deductions in order to lighten the tax burden for that. Other types of alternative assets, the first one on this list is LLCs, and when we talk about LLCs, we're talking about um, two different forms really. One, LLCs to gain checkbook control, which we'll be talking about in a little bit, and then of course investing in private companies. And you can do either as long as they're arm's length transactions. Um, so you can work using an LLC for checkbook control so that you have ultimate control over your IRA and you're writing checks for expenses and receiving income directly back to the LLC bank account. Or you can invest with private companies. It can be private stock and things of that nature. 
Also farm animals. Um, I know that that seems like something that would be very um, uncommon or very unique, and it is, but I would say that uh, with Advanta, we always say invest in what you know, and so if you work with racehorses or cattle on a regular basis and you know that, that might be where you want your retirement account to grow. We also see partnerships. We've seen things like movie projects, precious metals, and what we're talking about here very specifically is um, gold and silver bars or coins. Platinum, palladium, it's completely up to you. You do have to use a safekeeping facility when you're making those investments, but you can certainly do that. Equipment leasing, we've seen things like large format printers, um, ATM machines, there's been all kinds of unique investments um, as far as that goes, and then our clients are basically leasing that equipment out and having lease income back to their IRA. Forex or foreign currency trading accounts, private stock, commodities, oil and gas, again, all things that are allowed within a self-directed IRA. Some of those things I know can be publicly traded. We will only hold the privately held investments, but if you have a question on a specific investment, you can let us know, maybe send us the paperwork, and we can take a look at it and let you know if it's something Advanta can help you with. So I did mention that there's a very short list of investments that you can't make um, within an IRA, and here it is, only two things, life insurance and collectibles, and that's it. Aside from that, um, you know, the sky is the limit. There are certain people you cannot transact with, but as long as it's not life insurance and collectibles, it is probably an investment that you can do in your IRA. And we have, as examples of collectibles, antiques, alcohol, artwork, stamps, and coins. And again, you can do some coins as long as the value is based at what the metal is trading at and not something that's considered collectible or rare and antique. Um, another one that I want to mention because I get asked about it all the time are antique cars. And unfortunately, because they're considered antique and the value is, again, collectible, it's not something you can do in your IRA. Again, if you have questions, make sure you go ahead and type them into the chat box and we'll get them answered for you. Um, we had another one pop up here regarding checkbook control. Um, what do you have to report to the IRS um, or do you wait until distribution? That's actually a question for your CPA. So if you're thinking about using checkbook control, go ahead and check in with your CPA and find out what reporting you might need to do if you use an LLC within your IRA account. So people that you can't transact with, well, very first and foremost is going to be the IRA account holder. And when we use the word transact, we're talking very loosely here because there can't be a current benefit, you can't provide any sweat equity. So basically, again, arm's length transactions when you're using your IRA. So the IRA holder, the IRA holder's spouse, and then parents, grandparents, children, grandchildren, and then any spouses or business entities of those. So you want to just keep in mind that we're talking, again, about something that's considered arm's length third-party transactions. Other considerations, if you'll notice on the list on the previous slide, we did not include brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, or cousins because those people are not up and down your lineal tree. So it's not prohibited to deal with those persons, but we would caution you that it should be at a fair market value basis and that it should be um, for investment purposes. So you can work with those people if you choose, just again remembering the rules and making sure that you're doing it to grow your IRA. The use of a middleman between an IRA and a di disqualified person is also not allowed. They consider this a step transaction, so a very easy example of this would be if I owned a house personally and I wanted it in the IRA, unfortunately, there's not really a way to do it. But if um, I, let's say, sold it to my brother at fair market value and then he sold it to my IRA, all of that is at farm fair market value, and my brother is not somebody who is considered a disqualified person. However, the IRS says the intent was to get an I, a personally owned property into the IRA, and they, that is not allowed. So again, it's called a step transaction, and it doesn't matter how many steps are between you and the prohibited transaction, it's simply not allowed. In our next example, A's IRA lends to B, and B's IRA lends to A. Um, basically, that's a disqualified distribution, um, so you can see why that would be prohibited, and there's definitely a current benefit there. So again, an example of that would be, let's say my sister has 50000 in an IRA, and I have 50000 in an IRA, and we lend that money to each other. Basically, what we've done there is avoided paying taxes and penalties in order to get money out of our IRA. 
having an IRA lend money on a note and having that note secured by a collectible. So this is a great example here because what is the investment on record? It's the note, right? So the note is the investment. And as we mentioned earlier, you could lend money that isn't secured at all. So could you lend money and have the collateral be something that's collectible? The interesting thing is that you could do it. You would just have to be aware that should the borrower fail to pay, you could not repossess that collectible back to the IRA. You would either have to sell the distressed note or take the note as a distribution in order to repossess that item. So again, just something unique, some, um, something that our clients are doing that are really outside of the box investments. Transactions with disqualified persons, just more examples to get you guys really thinking about what you can and can't do. IRA purchases a piece of real estate from your son. Again, your son or my son is a disqualified person when it comes to my IRA, and so even if he sold it to my IRA at fair market value, that is not something that you can do. IRA owns real estate and leases it out to your daughter. Let's say that my IRA owns a, um, a rental property near a university. It has four bedrooms, and I tell my daughter, hey, grab three of your closest friends. I'll rent the, um, the house to you and to your friends. Everybody, including my daughter, is paying $400 a month in rent. Is that something that's going to be allowed? Unfortunately, again, my daughter is somebody that is, not, um, that is considered a disqualified person, and so my IRA cannot lease the property to her at all. But let's say, for example, that I replace my daughter with my niece. Would that be something that I can do? If it's for investment for purposes and it's a fair market value transaction, that is possibly something you can do with your IRA. Your father's IRA lends money to you or your son. Again, just up and down the lineal tree, prohibited transaction. Your IRA purchases real estate and hires your son or his company to perform the rehab work. Even if my son is actually not out there providing the sweat equity to that property, he sends you know, his employees out there, it is something that is still prohibited. And a lot of times I get people asking me, well, what, what if we don't pay his company or if I don't pay my son? Is that something that's allowed? And unfortunately it is not. There's no list of vendors that you are required to choose from when you're hiring people to do work on the property. It just can't be somebody that is up and down your lineal tree or has a current benefit from that transaction. <clears throat> your IRA makes a down payment for a property and you personally guarantee the mortgage. This is not something that will work because the, IRA, the IRS does not allow you to extend your personal credit or give a personal guarantee for a mortgage in the IRA. However, your IRA can use a mortgage to invest in a property that is allowed, but there are a few moving parts on there where basically it has to be a non-recourse loan. Um, the mortgage is to the IRA. It's usually a few points higher than whatever the interest rate is at the time, and banks usually want um, a, a larger amount down, so 30 to 40 percent typically. The IRA does have to pay the mortgage, and I know a lot of times people will say, well, I don't know that a bank will do a non-recourse loan. There are a few banks out there. It can also be seller financing or private money, so there are some options out there. <clears throat> Another thing that you should be aware of is that if you have a mortgage in an IRA, then you do subject the IRA to something called unrelated debt finance income tax. I'm not going to go into that during this seminar, but if you're thinking about using a mortgage as part of your, as part of your strategy, reach out to one of our offices and um, we can talk to you more about that. Um, in my next example, spouse's IRA owns a piece of real estate and wants to sell your IRA a portion of that property. Remember that you can't transact with people that are uh, directly related to you. So your spouse's IRA, unfortunately, cannot purchase a property from your IRA after the transaction is done. So once the purchase is made, it's already too late. But could you have partnered at the outset? That is something that is possible. So partnering is allowed even with disqualified persons. You can use personal cash as well, but the transaction has to be arm's length, meaning that it's new to you, new to your IRA, and in this case, new to, you, to your spouse and their IRA when you're making the purchase. And I have an example of that, and we'll talk about how you determine what the percentage of ownership is as well. 
Using IRA funds to invest in real estate, a lot of times I meet people who unfortunately did not know that they could keep the IRA intact and invest, and instead they take a distribution. So what happens when you take a distribution from a 401k or an IRA if you have not reached what the IRS considers retirement age or 59 and a half? Well, basically, if you're under age 59 and a half, it's right off the top a 10% penalty. So in my example, if I take a distribution of $100,000, I'm going to lose $10,000 right off the top. It's also um, taxable as income to me the year of the distribution. So if this year I take a distribution of $100,000, I'm going to pay $10,000 in penalties, and I'm also going to get a 1099 in the amount of the distribution, which is $100,000. So I could be paying another 20 30 or even 40% depending on my tax bracket the year of the distribution. So that could be you know, a lot in taxes, a lot that goes to the IRS. Not only that, but I'm losing buying power. So I just went from $100,000 in cash to invest down to maybe um, 70, maybe even 60,000 to invest. And then what happens um, for the lifetime of that investment when I hold it personally rather than in the IRA? Well, that is passive income, but income to me nonetheless with all of the rental um, income that I receive over the next however many years I hold that property. When the IRA holds that investment, again, it doesn't pay capital gains, so the income goes back to the IRA as passive income, and it's either tax-deferred or tax-free, depending on the type of account that you have. So we're going to get into some case studies now and talk about the different options available to you when you're holding rental property in your IRA. So the first example is going to be holding it directly with the IRA and managing it within the rules. The next example will be using a property manager and then last we'll talk about checkbook control and how that setup works. <clears throat> so our first case study again managing within the rules in this example, Susan has an old 401k account with $120,000 in it that she wants to use to buy real estate. She finds a property and negotiates the price for $85,000 and estimates that there will be $15,000 in repairs needed on the property in order to get it rent ready. So again, Advana IRA is here to help you with the account, but we give no investment advice, so it's going to be completely up to you on the property you choose. So if you come to us and say, hey, I want to invest in 123 Main Street, and I'm willing to pay this much, then it's going to be up to you or your real estate agent to help you negotiate the contract. And then once it goes to contract, we're going to help you make sure that everything is properly titled in the name of the IRA. You are going to let us know what work you're going to be having done and who you're going to hire for that. We're going to help you write checks for those expenses. And then once rented, we'll help you receive the income back to your IRA. So what does that look like? First, Susan is going to open her account with Advanta IRA, and we're going to help her move her funds from her 401k or IRA over to Advanta. She already found the, the property, so she's going to turn the contract over to us, and we're actually going to sign it because we are the legal signers for the IRA. Once we have the paperwork back, we're going to have her also complete a form that we have that lets us know who else besides Susan we're going to be working with. So who's the title company, the closing agent, um, or the title, or excuse me, the real estate agent that she might be working with, or closing attorney. Once we have all of that information, we're going to review the documents and make sure that they're titled properly in the name of the IRA. And then on the day of closing, we're going to sign all the documents. We always treat it as a mail away and fund the investment to the closing attorney or title agent for the property. The property will then be recorded in the name of the IRA. Um, so some, some important points here. Remember, Susan is keeping the property title directly through the IRA. So that means all of the expenses, such as the repairs, maintenance, taxes, and insurance, will be paid directly from the IRA. So Susan will just come to Advanta IRA, let us know that she has an expense she wants to pay. She'll submit the invoice and fill out a um, form with Advanta that says, please pay this bill. And then we'll go ahead and cut the check and either send it to her to give to the vendor or we can send it directly to the vendor. It's up to her. It's very important that she doesn't write any checks for expenses for the IRA from her personal account. She always wants to come to Advanta. And if it's a recurring expense, we'll make it really easy, have her complete a form maybe that says HOA fees due monthly, and then we'll just go ahead and pay them, and she doesn't have to contact Advanta each time she has a bill to pay. Um, Advanta processes the checks. 
um, and we will um, pay any expenses. So rental income is going to come directly back to Advanta. The rent checks are going to be made out to Susan's IRA, Advanta IRA, FBO, Susan Smith's IRA number 1234. When we receive that check, we'll see that it's 4123 Main Street, and we'll de deposit it to her account um, as rental income. Uh, what if she's short on funds? So this is a very common question we get. What happens if your IRA does not have enough funds to pay the expenses? Well, if Susan wanted to, she could have partnered with somebody um, at the outset, maybe a spouse or personal funds. If she didn't do that and now it comes up that she doesn't have enough cash, maybe that some big expense comes up like um, you know, a new roof or a new AC, she can always make a contribution if she's eligible. She can borrow funds. Again, in the form of a non-recourse loan, you can transfer between IRA accounts as often and whenever you like. If she still has funds in the 401k that she originally moved um, the funds from in the very beginning, she could always move some more from the 401k in order to cover it. Or she can bring a non-disqualified third party to partner into the investment and help her with those expenses. So again, since she already made the purchase, it's too late to bring in somebody who's considered disqualified. But if she wanted to bring in a non-disqualified third party as a partner in order to cover that expense, she could do so at this time. Um, I see a, another question popped up. If your IRA gave your nephew a mortgage to a home, could your IRA then pay the same nephew to perform rehab work um, as a contractor? Um, I would say that that would be something sort of a gray area, we can talk about that more, but um, ultimately no, because there would be some current, there would be a benefit to the IRA by performing that work. But um, we can talk that, about that again. Um, just email me afterwards and we'll get in touch with you. So that uh, concludes the case study on investing directly through the IRA. Now in this second case study, we're going to talk about the IRAs directly investing, however, using a property manager to oversee the day-to-day -day management of that. And in this example, we're going to have uh, Paul and Linda who are married, partner, so you guys can see how partnering works. Linda and Paul would like to partner IRA funds. They each have $100,000 in their IRAs. They find a property for $150,000, so already um, they're increasing their buying power by putting their IRAs together. They determine that it's going to need $20,000 worth of work to get it rent ready, and once rented, they're going to receive $1,500 a month back to, each, or back to the IRAs. <clears throat> now, I just made it really easy in this example. They're going to own it 50-50. It does not have to be 50-50 ownership, but it is going to be based on the amount of funds each entity or person brings to the table. So, you know, in this example, Paul and Linda each are going to bring 50%, but it could be 80-20, 90-10, it doesn't matter. But, you know, it's going to be based on the amount they can each contribute to, to the purchase. And then going forward, what's very important about that percentage of ownership, expenses are going to be divided along that line, and income is going to be received along that line as well, and that can never change. So Paul and Linda are going to each open an IRA account. Um, and the IRA accounts are going to um, be funded by Paul and Linda. They um, can transfer funds, again, from an IRA or roll funds in from 401ks or other um, pension plans, so on and so forth. Um, they made the offer. They agreed on the purchase price and submitted the contract to Advanta. And then in this case, because their IRAs are partnering, it's going to read as tenants in common on the documents as well as the deed. They're going to each complete a purchase authorization form letting us know who we're working with for this transaction. And then once we receive all the documents and they're properly titled, we're going to go ahead and fund the closing, $150,000. And again, remember they own it 50-50 in this example, so it would be $75,000 from each IRA for the closing, and then the um, owners of record are going to be their IRA accounts. So um, on, in the blue box here, I have an example of how the deed will read, Advana IRA, FBO, Paul's IRA uh, number as to a 50% undivided interest, and Advana IRA, FBO, Linda's IRA as to a 50% undivided interest. So that will show you how the deed will be. They are tenants in common. And again, the percentage is based on the amount contributed from each IRA, no more and no less. When they have expenses, in this example, what they've decided to do is hire a property manager. So 
what they're going to do is let us know who they're working with for property management, and then that property manager is going to collect the rents and pay any expenses per the management agreement. So I know not um, all property managers will pay 100% of the expenses or keep you know, enough in escrow to cover all of that, but if they ever needed more money, they could always let Advana IRA know and we could send a check to the property management company so that they can cover those expenses. The property manager management company will then net a check either monthly or quarterly, whatever the agreement is, back to Paul and Linda's IRAs. So that makes the transaction really easy, and they have somebody handling it, which makes this a um, completely hands-off investment for Paul and Linda. In this last case study, we're going to be talking about checkbook control and using an LLC in this example to make the investment um, and put funds together. Um, <clears throat> We're using an LLC in this example, but it certainly could be a trust. Uh, if you have questions about using a personal property trust to do an investment, let um, either myself or my associate Mike know and we can talk to you about that. Um, basically, in this example, we have three people who want to put funds together, Larry, Mary, and Gary. They're going to each open an account with Advanta IRA. They're using an attorney to help them with the LLC and draft the operating agreement. And that's very important because the operating agreement is going to show who the members are or the owners essentially for this transaction. And that's going to be the IRAs. So there's specific wording showing the IRAs as the owners of the LLC. Once we have all the paperwork for the LLC showing the operating agreement and we've had Larry, Mary, and Gary sign off on the operating agreement, um, we're going to go ahead and move the funds over to the LLC bank account. In this transaction, they've decided to make Larry the manager. So Larry opens up the bank account. He also signs the operating agreement as manager. And once we have that information from Larry, we're going to go ahead and fund the bank account. Once that happens, basically what Larry, Mary, and Gary have done is taken Advana IRA out of the, um, uh, the role essentially of overseeing money in and out of the account. So Larry now as the manager is going to do that. He's also going to sign any investment documents and Larry, Mary, and Gary do not have to come to Advanta in order to make investments. They're just simply going to review and once they agree, Larry can go ahead and make those investments on their behalf through the LLC. So in this example, again, we're investing in rental property. Once they find the property, it's actually going to be titled, again, in the name of the LLC rather than in the name of the IRA. And Larry's going to sign all of the documents. And then once that's done, he's going to receive all of the rental income back to the bank account for the LLC and write expenses for that property directly from the LLC bank account. So he has the control essentially over that. And it's not, um, it doesn't matter to Advanta IRA. Um, if one of them or all of them is the manager in this case, but once they make that determination, that's essentially how that setup will work. So things to remember about fractionally owned LLCs. When they're fractionally owned, it's going to be very important that um, if there's a capital call or just basically a need for more money, that funds are going to come first through the IRA and then go to the LLC. That's very important. So Larry, Mary, and Gary, because they invested with their IRA accounts, cannot just write a personal check to the LLC bank account. It first has to come through Advanta IRA, either in the form of a transfer, a rollover, or a contribution to the account. Advanta IRA will then help Larry, Mary, and Gary move those funds over to the LLC. Because in my example, they each own one-third um, a, a percentage of the LLC, they're going to make sure that when they fund the LLC with more money, that they're going to do it based on their percentage of ownership. So if they need 30000 additional cash to the LLC, then they each need to be able to contribute $10,000 from their IRA to the LLC. Um, they want to make sure that if any of them reaches an age where they want to take a distribution, that funds are sent proportionally back to the IRA accounts for each Larry, Mary, and Gary. But they don't have to take distributions if they don't need it. Just the person that wants it can then take it from Advanta IRA and take a personal distribution. But essentially, they can't write themselves checks from the LLC bank account to themselves personally. That's a disqualified distribution. There is no correct formula for checkbook control. It is basically um, in the operating agreement who the owner is, who the manager is. 
um, if you have more questions on that, you can let me know. But I know a lot of times when people are thinking about using checkbook control, they talk to somebody who will basically do it all for them, the IRA account and the LLC. And it can be very costly to do it that way when you can use your own CPA or attorney to help you with that. Um, and then Advana IRA can hold the account. Um, there are some case studies out there on this. Uh, a lot of times, um, you know, it used to be considered a gray area as to whether or not the IRA holder could be the manager of the LLC. If you have more questions about that, you can look up the two cases listed here or reach out to Mike or myself with questions. Um, I see another question popped up here. Um, with checkbook control, the renter needs to make the check out to the LLC. That is correct. The rent checks are going to go directly back to the LLC bank account. So if it's Real Estate Partners LLC, renters will make their checks directly to the LLC. And in that case, that was ease of transaction for Larry, Mary, and Gary, so that instead of having a renter write three checks, one to each IRA, they can do it directly to that entity, and then it will be deposited into that bank account. Again, the key points from this webinar, any IRA or former employer plan qualifies. You choose the investment, and all expenses are paid by the IRA, and any income is received by the IRA. And we saw just a few exceptions to that. Um, you know, if you're using a property manager, it can all go through the property management company. Or if you're using an LLC, that entity is going to handle the funds in and out of the IRA for that asset or any investment within the LLC. It's very easy to get started. It's just a matter of opening an account and finding an investment. And a lot of times people will find an investment and then give us a call and we can work with you there too. Uh, you just want to let us know. Largely the time frame that we can make an investment on your behalf is going to be dependent on where your funds are currently. So if you have questions on that, let me know. You can give us a call and set up a time to um, find out more about something specific that you're thinking about investing in. So whether it be a note, rental real estate, or you'd like to do fix and flips, let us know. We can help you. And I'll give you guys just a second. Type your questions into the chat box and we'll get any answered now. If I don't have anything else pop up, that concludes it. If you guys want to hang on just a second, we'll see if we have any other questions. I think that's it. I don't see any other questions popping up. If you guys uh, want to reach out to me with questions that you maybe don't want answered over the webinar, you're welcome to do so. Again, Mike is also av um, available for questions. Um, I did have another question pop up. Hold on just a second. Do you have to be employed to maintain a self-directed IRA? No, you don't. Um, if you are eligible to make contributions to an um, IRA or if you have an old employer's plan, you can do so. If you're not eligible to make contributions, it doesn't necessarily matter. You don't have to do that in order to continue to grow the account. So you know, if I was eligible to make a contribution this year to my IRA but next year I'm not, I can still make investments and have it grow. I just can't take money out of my pocket to put it in there. I have another question. Um, where are the annual property taxes and insurance invoices sent? Typically, if they're invested directly through the IRA, they're sent to Advanta, or they can be forwarded from the IRA account holder. Um, you know, if you want to use a, it's the same really with a property management company or an LLC. It's just your preference. What you want to do is make sure, depending on how you have the investment set up, whether through the IRA or through an entity, that the IRA is paying those expenses. So that's very important. Um, I had a few more questions here. Um, if you have an LLC, do you still go through Advanta to buy? Nope, the LLC and the manager of that LLC are going to make the investments. Uh, you do not have to come to, an adv to Advanta in order to make an investment. And as a matter of fact, if you're using checkbook control, we just ask that you annually update the value of that LLC. But other than that, you do not have to come to us. You just want to make sure that you're keeping really good records of funds in and out of the account in case you should need those records. Uh, that looks like it, so I'm going to go ahead and conclude the webinar. Again, if you have questions that you didn't necessarily want answered over the webinar, please feel free to reach out to either myself or Mike, um, and we are available to answer your questions. And I had one more pop-up here. Um, can you be the manager of your LLC, or do you need a third party? You can be the manager. You just can't take a salary, and you want to make sure that your LLC is following the rules and engaging in third party transactions.
And that looks like it, so I'm going to go ahead and conclude it. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. I hope you'll join us for one of our many other webinars. We have one coming up next week. Check out our website, advanaira.com forward slash events for the listing on that. Thank you.